We're gonna be talking about ski boots this session. Um, and this is pretty fun. Um, Greg Klein has appeared on Gear 30, as well as at previous Blister Summits. Hoji has invited himself on many a Blister Summit panel, but we're happy to have him back. But for the first time, ladies and gentlemen, Matt Manzer, uh, you might know Matt from like 30 episodes of a very deep dive on ski boots uh, from the Gear 30 podcast. Um, Matt's first time in Crested Butte. First time. M Matt's first time at the Blister Summit. Um, happy to have you here. Thanks. My pleasure. Very yeah. excited to be here. Um, so, let's do this. Ski boots. Um, cheers. Cheers, everybody. We're going to cheers because, as Greg said, we're just throwing a grenade t uh, right away to start this conversation. <laughs> His words. Um, you may remember at last year's Blister Summit, we did an entire ski boot panel that was largely focused on a thing called BOA. You've probably never heard of that. Um, it's been a year. And I wanted to begin by just saying, like, how has it been going? And there were big questions about durability. There were questions of, was this just a fad? There were questions of when skiers actually got in these boots, would they immediately just lose interest? I kind of thought we'd see about getting a State of the Union. And Greg Klein, I thought we would start with you, owner okay. of Willie's Ski um. Shop. Do you want to start with repairs or I, problems or where it... How's it going? Uh, it's going great. I mean, people are coming in looking for it because it's the newest tech. Um, there's also some other things out there. I mean, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but, you know, we had a polling of about 120 ski shops and BOA came in second, um, which was surprising uh, considering the other tech that, that was ahead. Um, but with BOA, people are thinking it's the perfect fit and it's just a mechanism. The cable is really the driving force behind that. So I, I don't know how to, people are interested in a better wrap, mm -hmm. but I also see problems because people think it's the one hit wonder. And like in snowboard boots, when we fix BOAs, it's because they're over cranked. You know, they have a low volume foot, the, you know, they're like, this is the boot, it's just gonna tighten, 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 and eventually you run out of room for that cable. So one that got jammed and one was just over tightened, you know, and wouldn't release. So two, so, two, two issues uh, with the issues as far as what people are looking for, I mean, it's still hot. You're gonna see more next year already. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, BOA's great. There are warranty issues. But you were saying one of the things you were seeing is somebody with a, a foot that was effectively too small for right. the shell. So uh, a brand, and I don't want to throw anybody under the bus because I buy from them and I like my discounts. Um, you know, they're going, well, you can get, you know, 120 width and you can now put a 98 width foot in there and crank out the difference. And that's just not how boots work. That's not how boot walls work, how they compress, you know. So the BOA is just a mechanism. It's, it, the, everybody's like, oh, it fits better. Well, all the new boots are coming out. They better fit better than the last ones. Otherwise, there was no reason to redesign them. Yeah. The BOA is just a mechanism, you know. So you'll see more BOAs, but you'll see, also see more counterfeits every or when I say counterfeit, a different way of tightening a cable system. You know, all the touring boots out there, they have cables, but very few have boas anymore. Mm -hmm. Matt, from Atomic's point of view, mm -hmm. how has, I think we can just call it year, year one of being on the market, yep. how, how has it gone from your perspective? Uh, it, it's gone super well, to be honest. Um, as Greg said, BOA is like the new hot thing that people are at least interested in, curious about, mm -hmm. you know. Um, we were one of the few brands that actually launched both a new boot with buckle and also a BOA option. Mm -hmm. So people could see, you know, how does the new shell fit with both of these closure systems, you know. 
and compare them side by side. And for us, it was a, honestly a re resounding success with BOA. Um, to the point where in 24, 25, next year's Hawks Ultra Extendeds are BOA only. Like the buckle option just didn't move, to be honest. Like there was such a high demand for the BOA boots that we just switched to just offering BOA in, the, in that particular mold series for next year. Um, so for us, it, it's just been a, a success in every sense of the word. Okay. Do you want to add anything to this conversation, Hoji? Uh, if only someone would try and achieve uh, a way to reduce volume inside the boot without compressing the shell, that would be nice. <laughs> like a liner? <laughs> Maybe. We should talk later. <laughs> we will. <laughs> this is this just became like a David awesome. Mamet script. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what just happened, but I like it. Do um, you want to keep that going? Yeah, I mean, I I don't I don't have uh, really much personal experience in the brand I work for is kind of gone in the alternative, a cable system, but not not the Boa just because they found another supplier that uh, they could work with. And uh, from their perspective, it was uh, the BOA kind of way that it worked is they, the BOA company would kind of, you would give them your product and they would put it on. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very, you, you couldn't, they didn't like the fact that you could um, have requests to do it in a different way. So that's ultimately why they went with another manufacturer, but uh, I, I agree with these, your guys' uh, experiences. Like it, it's just a different, a different system, and uh, the market will, the consumer group, like the success will speak, and for for the results out there, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it seems like a nice, a nice feature to have. Um, but I haven't, I haven't personally, like, other than trying on. <coughs> other brands boots I, I haven't had much experience so yeah cable uh, what do they say in Austria cable salat <laughs> cable salad so is that what they say in Austria man yeah. apparently yeah. that's a Lots that's a that's a that's the uh, translation of a rat's nest so. <laughs> wow <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm just, I'm just in the boat. All the um, cables. All the no. cables. Um, <laughs> let's switch topics. All uh, right. Maybe this well, goes. Maybe this goes quick. I don't know. Um, probably not. Yeah, yeah, probably not. That's probably the right answer. Yeah. Weight. Um, we talk about it a lot at Blister. Um, I want to ask both, and we'll go. I want to ask manufacturers. From what you all are seeing and working on, do we think manufacturers are more obsessed with weight, and that usually means reducing weight on boot products, less obsessed than perhaps they were a year or two or five years ago? And then I'm gonna ask the follow-up, are you getting feedback, intel, whatever, that the customer is more or less obsessed with bringing ski boot weights down. So let's start with what we think the manufacturer perspective is. Um, I think some categories are always gonna be weight obsessed. Like the more we dive into the touring world, people will be just consciously aware of how much their gear weighs because they're the ones bringing it up to the top of the mountain. But when it comes to resort boots or alpine boots specifically, it, having a lightweight product is definitely less and less of a, a, a request, you know. People are realizing lightweight boots were very interesting when they first came out, but then they started to realize, well, if we're making them lighter, something has come out of these, right? And so we as a brand, at least on the atomic side, we've been putting the weight back into certain boots just to make sure we deliver on the skiing performance side of things. 
um, because that was one of the first things that really suffered when you start to go super light with pure Alpine resort focused boots. So when we launched the second generation of Hawks Ultra, like that was the first generation of Hawks Ultra was like the first real lightweight Alpine boot, right? And so when we made the second generation, the resounding feedback was, hey, can you make this a little bit more stable? I'm missing some of the horsepower that I used to have uh, in my you know, older boots, and I'd like to have that back. And so every year we've been kind of making a new Hawks boot or even a Hawks XTD, the extended boots. They've all gotten a little bit heavier because we're reinforcing key zones more just so they can ski well. And this means the weight tends to go up, you know? Um, so from the Alpine side of things, things got a little bit heavier. Um, touring boots will always try to stay in their kind of classifications. Um, at, at Atomic, we break the touring world down into three nice and easy groups. You know, you've got this kind of free ride touring, the heavier stuff on one side of the equation. You've got super light, more uphill focused on the other side. And you've got the kind of general purpose, do it all in the middle. Each of those categories is ultra obsessed with having the right weight for their category, right? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, weight is still a talking point, but they're trying to find what is the right weight for how they ski and how it pairs well with the, the binding and the ski that they've got, you know? So in, in one sense, it matters for, for touring, for sure. But as we more you get into the resort stuff, alpine, chairlift specific, it's becoming less of a a requested thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Performance is always going to be the main driver on the resort boots. When it comes to less or more, people will want more performance. Nine times out of ten. Coach. Uh, yeah, no, it's uh, the categories. I mean, that's that's always the way the the manufacturers kind of look at things. Um, and I'm I'm obviously the disruptive force in many ways uh, in this kind of general purpose uh, product to, to try and, you know, find that right weight, not be so light that you, you can't ski on anything and, and not be too heavy to, to get to where you want to go. So it's, uh, it's definitely, uh, um, it's a balance. Um, and I think I think we're getting like everything's kind of uh, it's becoming clearer and clearer with every uh, year that goes by um, where you know like we figured it out in skis I'd say and uh, bindings of course but uh, the boots yeah it's it still comes down to what percentage of of use is uphill or downhill in that mid category of course Alpine like. I mean, just having that mass on your feet just adds so much stability and like d a damping effect. Um, and, and you're never gonna walk except to the bar or whatever here. Um, so it doesn't matter. So of course, like I, I agree with that, what Matt, Matt has said uh, mm -hmm. on the uh, Alpine side of things. I don't see why they, they would, you know, like the general consumer in that category would benefit from a lighter boot because yeah. um, they're just going to bounce off everything. Um, Hoji, quick, quick question. For the scheming you're currently doing and have been doing with boots, because I think this kind of ebbs and flows a bit. There are times, I was talking with Cody today, and he was like, yeah, I used to be trying to save every gram possible for going uphill. And he's like, I just am less obsessed about that than I used to be. And so I think it's fair that at different times we try different ends of that kind of weight spectrum. So for you, you know, in the last maybe 12 to maybe 24 months, do you find yourself thinking about how do I remove that weight from the boots you are most interested in skiing and working on and putting out to the world? Is that become more, are you more weight conscious or less these days? Uh, I mean, my, my approach uh, at this moment is, uh, like, I'm, I'm actually, I'm really, um, as a, for my personal use, like, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm comfortable with, like, I like the two-liner system. And, like, mm -hmm. if the shell can provide the performance mm -hmm. at, a, at a good weight 
and I have a lightweight liner that's a couple hundred grams lighter for, for early ski touring. And this is really like a prosumer, like it's, yeah, I, I mean, everything's so expensive, but, um, and then a heavier liner that has more um, a damping effect and just kind of, it, it adds a lot to these super rigid uh, shells that we have. Um, and, and you get a bit of the weight back uh, for the downhill performance. So for my personal use or whatever, and I know that's not a realistic uh, approach for, for manufacturers, of course, um, but the, I find that that's allowing me to use the, the shells that I want in, in a wider range of use. Um, and th that's nothing new. I've been doing, a lot of people have been doing that for, for a while. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting, like changing the liner, you can really change how, how that boot yeah. performs for certain activities. Yeah, you know? yeah. Greg? Okay. Um, you know, it goes, like, like Matt was saying, it goes by category. Um, I always think there's going to be a designer out there trying to win the ISPO award in the touring section until they go negative, right? <laughs> it's going to be filled with helium, or this year we took another three grams off. Um, but that's Xanadu. Uh, when you get to, you know, real usable stuff, Alpine, and, and then getting into racing, I can't tell you the last time I've had a customer mention, this is too heavy. Um, I can tell you Matt's original Ultra, uh, Hawks Ultra, I had a lot of people mentioning how light it was, but then you take away performance. So the shells have to be, like he said, the right weight um, when it comes to uh, uh, the boots. So the heavier you go with racing boots, the more energy transfer. And, and so people really don't shop weight. They shop comfort. Uh, when we're talking Alpine, and, and I don't sell any touring, so I know customers will come in and ask for, for that. Um, but if you're talking resort, hybrid boots even, because hybrid boots are more concerned with the experience going downhill, in my opinion, mm -hmm. you need mass to trans transfer energy. So um, it's not really a selling point. It's behind other things. Comfort first, uh, flex first, energy performance first. Okay. You know, those issues. Weight, not so much anymore. You want to respond to any of that? We good? Uh, pretty good. I mean, just one like weird data point. Like, the, I think one of the the reasons the lightweight thing kind of caught on at first. I'll get closer. Sorry. Um, was because it, it's really hard to measure ski boot performance in a store, right? How many of us actually demo ski boots? Like very few, other than today, yeah. Um, but everybody can pick up a boot and go, whoa, that's lighter than the other one next to it on the wall. Mm -hmm. And I think that was some immediacy that people got out of it. It wasn't yeah. just a story, like they kind of felt it, right? Yeah. And that's, I think, just kind of why it, it got really interesting for a little bit. But then as they went and skied it, some were, I mean, we had a lot of really happy people with them. Um, but if anybody was looking for that extra bit of performance, damping, suspension, you know, stability to their boot, those were the first people to kind of say, I wish I would have more plastic in my ski boot type mm -hmm. of thing. All things being equal, if the boots fit exactly the same, my experience is, you know, when I'm mm -hmm. boot fitting person, we're trying on five fits and the fits determine, yeah, that was really light, but man, it did not fit my ankle. So it always goes back to, yeah, it's mm -hmm. gonna be the first one pulled off the wall, um, but it always is fit. And you gotta remember the kid, guy, girl, lady pulling it off the wall is the sales person, right? They've had experience with it. So they look at a foot. We don't go and <laughs> go, you, you look like you need a lighter boot, you know, <laughs> looking at your foot and going, you need something really wide, you know, that, that's, that is the key metric is, is a lot of the times the guys on the sales floor, the girls on the sales floor, they're the real mm -hmm. deciding barrier there. Hmm. Hoji. Mm -hmm. Still here. 
awesome. <laughs> um, Present. You got a new boot out. I want you to tell us a little bit about it, and then I'm gonna let our panelists say why that all sounds awesome or terrible. Put it on the table. <laughs> Are you wearing them? He's wearing them. You're Drew Peterson, yes. <laughs> yes. No, I had a, a great day of skiing and uh, came in a bit, right, we shut her down and uh, yeah, then a few tech talks out there and a beer later. And, <laughs> We're hot tinning to get up here, so no time to change. Uh, and that's fine. Um, but yeah, probably, I don't know if most people had the chance to come by, and uh, there's a couple guys at the Dean and Fit booth, and I'm, I'm kind of the lurking in the shadows around there and jumping in at any opportunity. But uh, yeah, the new, the new boot, uh, the Ridge, um, it's kind of, kind of, I think, it, it's a very progressive boot. It ha it's bringing a lot of uh, a new closure system, what it's offering. Um, and I mean, my approach to that boot at the beginning three years ago to, to start on the project was like, based off all the experience I've had with all the people who used the original boots and other boots and like trying to identify what it, what's a real problem that, that, that we're experiencing. And uh, that problem was, uh, you know, compressing the shells and, and doing all these things to try and get that heel like seated properly and, and have like a consistent foothold on, on from like your toes back up your instep into your shin. And, uh, and so this boot, we, we kind of, that project, uh, which I guess I was leading unofficially, um, yeah, that was the, the problem to, to, to approach what's the next thing. Um, and yeah, the, the idea, the concept was like, how can we in, like make the, the foothold independent of the shell shape um, and the security and get like a really positive heel hold and a, and a nice consistent surface all the way up from your foot up up to your shin. So, um, this this was uh, the starting point, and yeah, we developed a, a new kind of dual tongue system with an inside tongue that and a cable system um, to allow you to like micro adjust. And and the the tongue system is kind of what they call it the floating tongue, but it's just sliding, which isn't isn't really actually something new, but the new, the innovation, I would say, is it kind of combines like this inside tongue, which some of the, the Rondonay boots have, but maybe it's not moving. Uh, and inside tongues came from, as far as I know, like the, the rear entry boots in the 80s because they had just like a triangle box so everyone could get in. And then they had this in, internal plastic, soft plastic tongue with a cable system uh, to, to, to adapt that triangle big box shell to hold the foot. Hmm. Um, so yeah, the combination of like an external tongue that's moving with an inside tongue attached to it. Um, it's, the goal is to be, have like a highly adaptable um, fitting ability and also the, the sliding um, aspect of it is, is beneficial for, for walking. Like all the boots with tongues, like we kind of in the, in the touring world in the, kind of lighter stuff it's always a gator because you have no resistance um, and that's great for walking but like the closure systems on the forefoot and the, uh, somewhere on the shin and like that middle section of your foot is completely open and like if you're real coming from an alpine background you will never achieve like the proper hold that you're looking for if you're coming from yeah that world the alpine world so uh, yeah that that's kind of the the, the short, long story, I guess. <laughs> Great. Does that make sense to you? A new closure system that should pr provide a better fit. I'm going to go out on a limb just because I can look at it. Um, sounds like a rear entry touring boot to me. I, I have no idea. Um, I'll show you cool. later. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Sounds interesting. Yeah. But, I, you know, without mm -hmm. getting my hands on it, no idea. Sounds like. But but to speak to the like the what you mentioned earlier with this, the the boa, and like what what we're seeing like 
the cable system to really crank down and like try and reduce and, and compress the, the hard structure of the shell and, and like over cranking and putting a lot of force on that cable and winding it way in. This works in a different way where like you're reducing that volume without trying to compress the shell. And like you still have to wind the cable in, but the tension is based on like the comfort on your foot and the security on your foot. So you're never gonna like, you won't put the cables through the same initial load. That's, that's kind of the principle there. Conceptually, does that make sense to you? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Pretty good sense. Um, it, this, this kind of brings up a, a good discussion, like more of a general higher, a high level talking point of solutions versus needs. And kind of going back to buckles versus BOA debate even, that people say, well, I don't need BOA, right? Buckles are fine. Mm -hmm. I've heard this argument on like almost every uh, thread on, on the internet type of thing. And I would agree with you that no one needs BOA because that's not what it is. BOA is a solution. The need is to have a good fitting boot, right? And this is the mistake that a lot of brands make uh, when they're coming up with a new product, whether it's our industry or bikes or cars, whatever, is they confuse needs and solutions. The solution is what we're after, right? A good fitting boot that skis well, that is dry, right? These very high level concepts, right? These are the needs. The solution is a buckle to create the fit, to wrap the shell. BOA is a solution to create the fit, wrap the shell, right? What Hoji just described is a solution to the need of fit. Finding a way to, to make a new, uh, improve the fit of the boot, right? Because as we'll all pretty much talk about, fit is going to be the, the number one thing when it comes to ski boots. So this is why BOA is such an exciting thing or the new system that you've come up with because we're always chasing a better fit, right? And these things are all solutions to the need of creating that better fit, right? So when you look at it from that way, I, I totally agree with what Hoji's talked about. Conceptually, it makes total sense because mm -hmm. we're all chasing the need of making a, a better fitting ski boot. This is just the unique solution that, that Dina Fits come up with. I wanna knock out a couple questions and these maybe are shorter answers and if something if, if one of you manages to say something particularly interesting we'll like you know pump the brakes and run down that rabbit hole um, because we will get to audience questions in a bit here but um if you because we we called this uh part of this panel session was talking about what's next where where are we headed where are the promising or interesting places to maybe go in ski boots so if the question for each of you was talk about something where we've, we've just been talking about the importance of fit, fit and comfort. Would you rather with your, you know, allotted two minutes, talk about liner tech or some other element in the fit comfort world space? So you get to talk either about liner tech or some other element of fit and comfort. Oof. Um, can I do both? It's an or. No. You want an one. or? Okay. The better one. We don't want your B material. <clears throat> I think, and what we've been talking about for a couple of years now, um, for sure brands are always going to be looking at, you know, evolving the last of their boot. Like the last is the internal part that creates the fit, right? But so many good lasts exist, but there's a lot of room on the liner side, to be honest. I think we're gonna see more and more advancements in the, in the liner side of things because the lasts have gotten so good and there's gonna be some really small tweaks that we do in the future on future projects, but it's not like we're like, oh, we have to throw this idea out. This doesn't work anymore, right? from a last perspective. So I think on the liner side is where you're gonna see newer technologies, better materials to create a boot that fits well from the beginning, but one that also retains that fit 
and holds it on longer, right? To have, have the best of both worlds. <laughs> so um, having that first fit is gonna be the challenge of mm. certain brands that were maybe just mentioned, you know, because that's a hurdle that has to be overcome. And what sells or doesn't sell a boot is how things feel when they're compared against five other competitors within the span of two minutes. Well, you know, it's an hour and a half. But, yeah. <laughs> but, but yes. when you're I'm, I'm a whole good. boot, no, a whole boot fake session will take that long. Are you guys but talking about sex or what? But you're gonna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know when you put you bring out three models, three. whatever. Yeah, I'll pull first. three. I'll pull three. So you're gonna try them on one on the left foot, one on the right foot, and someone's gonna tell you pretty quickly which one's not as good. That gets taken off and put back in the box. That happens in one minute. Your whole boot fitting section or um, you know appointment takes an hour. Assessment takes 20 minutes, but when you're trying on brand A, brand B, that happens really quickly. Sometimes it takes longer, of course. Finding the right boot can take hours. But when you put a boot on that doesn't fit right, mm -hmm. you're not keeping it on for much longer. Mm -hmm. you know? And this is a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. So you have that part of the puzzle to figure out. Then you have the part of the puzzle to make it customizable so that it fits more people than just the out of the box fit. And then it has to retain that customized fit longer. These are the needs of a liner. We have a solution. Other brands have solutions, right? But those are the needs that will be addressed. Great. Um, I'm going to go with liner, but I'm going to bring it back to my concerns with BOA. And this is, <laughs> it goes to another solution. Um, I don't think it's any surprise to anybody that the liner is simply the most expensive part of a ski boot after you get the molding done. The problem is I've already seen the lines for next year, I've seen pricing for next year, and my fear is that they've jumped significantly in price. A, a, uh, a BOA mechanism is a really expensive part of a boot. And in order to hit the price points for the market, you, I've seen manufacturers uh, decrease the ingredients in a liner. It's not quite as good. So how do you retain? And, and I think liners are the next thing. I think you're going to see marketing of liners. I think you're going to have, when you go into a ski shop, it's going to be the liner next to it on the wall because the liner is really what we're talking about. And there's some impressive liners out there. I mean, you know, the, the aftermarket for sure, but what Matt and some other brands are doing are amazing. And nine times out of the 10, it never gets pulled. I mean, for us, we pull it when we're measuring your foot and checking the volume, but it comes back to how much price increase can I afford in that BOA mechanism or would you like to put another $25 into the quality of that liner? Hmm. You know, that comes out to 100, 150 bucks retail. You know, so there's, there's some trade-offs. It's not just a solution. Mm -hmm. Sorry to go, no. I did both. That, kind of, that was pretty well, that was slick though. So You're I, welcome. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty slick. It's good wine. Yeah. Thank um, you. By the way, sorry, but this is Hoji's fault. I. This, who, whoever's gonna win the panel, this panel session, Hoji brought up sex. Has anyone had sex in ski boots? <laughs> you win the panel. You either win or lose, but probably win. But if one of you raised your hand, I was like, oh, you just won the panel. So anyway, all right. Yeah. Um, I'd never <laughs> thought about that before. And uh, anyway, all right, let's go back to whatever we were talking about. Um, I'm surprised there was only one hand that went up. Yeah, that's, that's that weak. Was, yeah, weak. <laughs> well, my hand went up. Did it? Yeah, okay. Oh, okay, well, how would you win yeah. the panel? All right. Uh, I didn't think we were in a competition. We're friends. That's not sudden death. You? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Next. Two. Us? What are we doing? We're, we're, 
this is the losing cool panel side session. of the table. That's this the is cool the nerdy side, side yeah, of the yeah. table. Yeah, we yeah, established yeah. that. I mean, yeah. I think we established that a while ago. Uh, but well, somebody, um, this is what happens when you major in philosophy. <laughs> yeah, right? you don't have sex in ski boots. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I call it the welcome fit. What? <laughs> Sorry. Repeat. <laughs> you, repeat. The what wel you? the welcome fit. It's. Uh, yeah. You'll learn about it later. I'll show you. <laughs> Product testing. I'm not going to stick around for that one. Yeah, let's flex. (laughs) Next. Blister Summit after dark. Um, (laughs) Your turn, Hoji. Uh, Liner tech or moving in a different realm of the fit comfort range? Yeah. I mean, it's tough. Like, I agree with the last. Like, I I think the boots are in a way where the the lasts are, you know, we kind of... I mean, there's companies measuring millions of feet, and and that that data should should help with the pushing the needle forward to coming up with a common commonality of, you know, what's going to work with the most amount of feet. But uh, yeah, I think liner tech is is cool, and um, I totally agree. It's depending on the manufacturer. It's some companies don't put it enough into the liner, or it's like the afterthought. And uh, I mean, in an ideal world, like the prosumer group, probably a lot of people here, um, you know, like what you always hear is like, well, why, why can't they just sell the shell, you know? Hmm. And then we get to choose hmm. because it's such a personal, it's like really your connection with your ski equipment. And I mean, that would be great if, if, if we could ever get to that. But it, from a business side, from a manufacturer, that's... That Not, doesn't work. It, Everybody's no. in agreement up here. No. That doesn't that work. That doesn't, doesn't work. work. So and like it, it's it's in, in every climate, every every environment. And like I just did one of these uh, over in in Austria, and I, I asked, I wanted to involve everyone. I was like, so how many people here have tried like any kind of aftermarket liner? And there's like one guy who was a boot fitter, and that was it huh. out of a hundred and whatever people. So huh. it, it just depends where you're at. Like mm-hmm. our culture here in North America. Skiing is like a specialty thing from the beginning. It's not built into the overall culture as it is in, in Europe. And they're, you know, like they just get the boots and they go skiing. And it's just part of it. And like here, it's like you have to be seek out skiing or be fortunate to be exposed to it. And then you become like more kind of you want you want what you want. So it, it, it's sort of the liner thing, like all the requests or the needs as Matt laid out, it's, it's such a puzzle, like the welcome fit, like, can you even get in? Can, can you just wear it? Can you, can you call it the welcome? Yeah, that's a, that's the Italian welcome, uh, the welcome fit. Here's some sex. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Like when, like when you go in, is it comfortable? You know? Wow. uh, But, but those, is that what you ask? Just, just be clear. I have never fit a bit this way. <laughs> Are you cool? Oh, but and if my wife, my wife's gonna watch this. I so. mean, you're very attentive. That's a very thoughtful thing to ask. Yeah. Wow. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but they, they contradict uh, all these things. It's, it's really hard. It's like you want to get in easily. You want it to be comfortable. But that doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't equate to, to skiing performance. <laughs> Oh, I'm trying to be serious. I don't know what we're. T- <laughs> <laughs> Why Next <not>? topic. <laughs> so what we've established a hundred percent, the title of this panel session is "Sex and Ski Boots," which I couldn't really be happier about. That's got to be good for like the algorithm, I suppose. I'm sure, so, it'll yeah. catch up. Anyway, it's when the most popular blister podcast ever. ever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sex and ski boots. Okay. Um, man. Uh, let's see. I want to open this up to audience questions. So if anybody you have questions, you see the mics on the side. Um, Don't walk in front of the center cameras. Or you have to buy us all drinks. Um, while people are coming up, let's do this couple, just a couple minutes. Anything um, specific that our audience should know about... Uh, on the what's next front. Anything interesting we can divulge 
thoughts, curiosities, opinions? Greg. Me? Uh, let, let's see. Um, no, I mean, it's all a refinement of what we've been doing. Um, walk ski mode is going to continue. Um, I won $10,000, $20,000, right? There we go. Yeah, yeah. Um, Those guys were too scared to show up yeah, and pay their chicken. bets. <laughs> well, they couldn't afford the flight after. Um, it's just going to be more refinements, you know, uh, scanning feet, getting better lasts, better materials, those things, especially in ski boots. You're going to see refinement. In step, you're going to see different fastening systems, better materials. I do think you're going to see some sneaking in of the old soft boot technology, soft panels for a little bit more give, a little bit more. I don't want to. I've signed some things I can't talk about, but you'll see some things coming um, in in that vein. Not back to the soft boots or the exoskeleton boots, but just, uh, you know, a little bit more flexibility in some textiles. Okay. Um, let's get to the questions. Concise questions, concise answers. That's what we're going for. Um, sure. Let's start here. So I'm actually going to go for a twofer here. The first thing is the one thing we haven't touched on at all is the footbed component. And I work as a boot fitter, and I don't think I'm doing my job if I'm not talking about that. Mm -hmm. There's two ends, the book ends for you guys. One end is the manufacturer. How does that play into your, your end of the thing? And then obviously from the, the shop owner's perspective, how do you guys feel that fits in? And then I'm gonna sneak in a tech question, heat moldable shells versus shell plastic that you can't mold. Where do you guys come down on that? I tend to lean towards moldable. It gives me an extra tool, but I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. Let's go fast on heat moldable and then we'll go to the footbed question. Yes. You like heat moldable. You like heat moldable. Uh, <clears throat> to be honest, every ski boot has a, is a plastic that you can heat up and you can stretch it, right? We've been doing that for 30 plus years. Um, some plastic is just easier, right? And I think that's what like, brands like Atomic have really pushed forward since 2013, 14-ish times um, are plastics that are going to heat up more consistently, but then also not shrink back. Because if anybody here is a, is a boot fitter, when you do stretch a ski boot, you have to be careful to leave it on the press for a certain amount of time, make sure the plastic reaches glass transition temperature, all these things, so that the plastic retains the shape that you've given it, right? So part of Part of what makes these newer plastics just more exciting for boot fitters is they just retain that shape that you've given them, right? Quick. You interested? Heat moldable? Don't care. You don't care. I mean, no. I, I, yeah, I think it's absolutely critical for uh, fitting and for shops and for, for me or, yeah, like, but I, I don't know any boots that I've used that I can't mold. Uh-huh. And... Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I've, I, I have very, like, uh, I can mold depending on what I'm doing. I, yeah. I can use a glove and, like, push it out. And, and, and it seems to re retain, like, I achieve results depending on what part of the boot. But I, I think it's, uh, I, I agree, like, it's, uh, it's a, very, a very critical point. Like, uh, the plastic should be punchable. Mm -hmm. Greg? Mm -hmm. um, like, like Matt said, everything is heat moldable. Um, the, the advertised heat moldable ones, they get you 60% there. Um, if you have bone spurs, that kind of stuff, you know, a, a, a great boot press is never uh, a bad thing to have. Um, if you have a Kaiser press, you know, everything is manageable. You know, I have one store that has that and, it, and I just love working with it. Um, you, you know, can even cold press boots. And, and, and I bought your presses as well, and I love those, Matt. They're awesome. Were you impressed? I bought four. <laughs> that was good. Nope, that was clever. I, 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 I bought four he's of them, sharp. Matt. I he's bought sharp four. Tonight. Yeah, he's on so. I, I think the hot ball is a good uh, hot ball, sir. I like that mm. technique. And oh, boy. I don't see now that we're, too now much. We're going yeah. Yeah. Another. Is, anyhow. <laughs> Next. Footbeds. Footbeds. Um, I use them, I like them. Um, I really like, there's a lot of 
great trim to fit out there. Um, I also, I'm a ski coach, so I'll coach at the Ligeti Wybreck ski camps mm -hmm. in the summer, so I get to work with, you know, <laughs> seven-time gold medalists and a lot of Olympians. You'd be surprised. I know a couple that don't use any footbeds mm -hmm. in World Cup boots. Mm -hmm. I know a guy that puts footbeds under liners. <laughs> don't laugh. Uh, I know a guy that puts footbeds in his socks, which, well, it's genius. You pull out the footbed, you don't get dinged for the height. But it all comes to personal preference. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've seen guys where you would lose your mind. They're absolutely grinding to the inside, so they have more ball of foot. It all comes down to sensitivity and personal preference. Um, I, can, I can make myself the nicest footbed in the world. I really like something with some flexion in it and softness to it. Hmm. Um, I think the days of in the 80s where they made it out of hard orthoplastic are long gone. You know, um, a footbed always enhances a boot. There's almost no days where it doesn't. World Cup racers are different because you couldn't put a thimble of water in that boot. There's no room. Their, their feet are bound, so I wouldn't get too hung up on the footbeds that they use. Quickly, you two. Footbeds? Uh, yeah, I, I like footbeds, I agree. Um, I think it adds a, a level of form fitting, um, but also the flexible stuff, especially for ski touring and, and weight comes down to it. And it all comes down to the boot that you're in and how much room you wanna take up or, or not, you know, like um, just adding a few millimeters under your foot can change everything and make the boot unwearable or make it wearable. Yeah. Um, so I've used them different ones for years uh, since I was a ski racer 20, 30 years ago, almost 25 years ago. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's, once you get to the level that you recognize that, it's hard to go back. Um, but it's also like, it's easy to go too far with too much support and then you're actually, you're depending on on your use but i've had the experience where i footbeds melted or whatever didn't have footbeds anymore and then my feet were just cramping like crazy because yeah. the arches the muscles have like given up you know so it's mm -hmm. uh, it's very personal yeah it's very mm -hmm. personal should we move on do you, you yeah we're uh, quick on. quick quick yeah. note <laughs> um big fan of footbeds i think that should go without saying for most of us um because our feet have evolved as a suspension platform for running away from cheetahs and stuff like that, you know? They have no business being in a plastic cast called a ski boot. Yeah. So a footbed really helps create the interface between your flexible foot and the rigid hunk of plastic that it's in. Mm -hmm. So as a general statement, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of them. Um, from Atomic's point of view, we put in something into the boot that is a, a kind of a good starting point, you know? knowing that good boot fitters are going to pull out whatever we put into the shell or into the liner because you have your favorite system that you know that you know how to work and operate so from atomics point of view we try to give a good kind of neutral canvas to it that allows you to work with whatever brand that that you like in your shop okay we just created a new summit rule no two-part questions <laughs> so you bring your a material that's it a material answers only. Obviously, this has been a super professional panel up here where we never got off the rails. So yeah, we expect the same. Um, actually, much better from all of you. It's unfair, but that's the world. So your one question would be? Very short, very specific question. Uh, boa on upper cuff on Alpine boots. Is it gonna happen? Greg. The closure mechanism to get the cable over, because, I mean, that's the part that has to come the whole way apart. I've been thinking about it for a very long time. Um, BOA cannot be the only mechanism there. You're going to need a latch or something that you can throw over. But now you're adding $100 to every BOA, which, every boot, which now adds 200 to $300 to your to your boot. I'd rather see it, quite honestly, in liners. Uh, if, if, if we're going donuts and dollars, I'm giving you a better liner. Matt. Just it. Matt. 
it's happening. Uh, <laughs> All right. Um, we, That's it. Done. Yeah, done. Uh, Boa, we, we started testing the Boa that you've seen on, on ski boots since 2018. And from that day, from Boa's point of view, it was always Boa on the cuff, Boa on the shell. They always wanted to come out with a complete system. Um, obviously, given COVID and developmental slowdowns, that kind of thing, the first element that came out was the one on the shell. But it will be a release for the 25-26 season. That's when you will see it come out. Uh-huh. Liner, Not before that. Liner or upper cuff? On the plastic cuff of the ski boot. Okay. So not uh, an, uh, an additional part on the liner. That already exists, but we're talking something on, on the plastic part of the cuff. If you've been paying attention to any of the, the forums and the chatter that's out there, you would have seen even racers also testing this hmm. on the World Cup. Okay. I'm going to format my question as Jonathan formats questions. Oh, no. Uh, you guys have that's talked about idea. footbeds. You've talked about lasts both being essential great parts of the boot. We've talked about liners a little bit being a shortcoming. Ski boot manufacturers still sell and send a disposable footbed in the liner. Mountaineer Sports and Verbier only sell shells and custom fit liners. Hoji, I wanna push back on you saying that can't happen. Why can't that happen? Thoughts? And I, I can help that one too. Yeah, Me too. I, mean, you should, I, I am not a shop guy. Like, I drink beer in the back of the shop. That's what it is. So, for sure. For just, just to be clear, that's what we do too. Um, inventory. So, you know, it, boot design and, and standing up here and talking to you, the, real, uh, the product life cycle of a boot gets shipped to me. I look at it today. I'm writing orders tonight. It's shipped to me in August. By this date, every year, every manufacturer wants to be out of that model and moving on to bring extra buckles, extra parts, extra liners. The industry, the, the, the companies that you think are huge cannot afford to staff, stock, and hold that inventory. You know, everybody's like, well, go back to your manufacturer if they're out of that inventory. That liner, that shell is long gone. They're very rare instances that I can go back and get a liner. The reason their whole gear is made for a complete system, right? But they one part d- of that system is just fully disposable from the get-go. No, no, no. I mean, with, with if, if bed, I'm buying, right? if I go to Atomic and say, Matt, I'm buying a thousand, li- a thousand shells at XYZ Flex, and I don't want to We're talking. Liner. Yeah, we're, we're, he, he's taking my order. But here's the problem is what you're talking about is specialized custom boot fitting. They can't hit the volumes that you need for shell only. Because remember, the the liner factory still has to pay the workers, right? And they're geared to two systems. So not to go off on a tangent, but it comes down to economics. Everybody likes to get paid. In fact, all my employees like it. Everybody at the factory, they kind of dig it. so these are designed as a component system. It would be like shipping cars without wheels. You know, at a certain point, you know, you, you can do that if you order 10,000 cars. You can get it customized. But the shops you're talking about, there's not enough volume to hit that tipping point. Does that make it, Yeah, that it good? makes sense. And I know Mountain Air does a ton of volume, and that's why they're able to do it. Um, you know, they, they order a lot of shells, but I was just kind of pushing for like, it takes thinking differently to, you know, if we're always disposing of that crap internal footbed and expecting a great boot fitter to put in that good boot, uh, footbed and we're admitting that the lasts of the boots are good and that custom orthotics are good. At what point do we just do a paradigm shift and also make better liners or abandon your attempts? Well, <laughs> what? <laughs> Well, uh, okay. So, hot sauce. Uh, so the, 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 sorry. Do you want to? No, no. Let me. He, from a manufacturer's point of view, what you're asking for is not impossible. Clearly, there are some shops that do this, right? The issue is complexity. Ski boots are some of the most complicated things to make for how much we sell them for, right? Mm-hmm. Sure. 
cars are more complicated, but they also cost way more. Um, mm -hmm. Ski boots, if, if I make a shell only program for a guy's 130s, women's 115s, well, he, his shop goes 100, 120, not 110, 130. So now I gotta have 130, 120, 110, 100. The complexity here starts to build up like crazy. And it's been something, you know, me as, a, as an ex-boot fitter, you know, as a shop kid, I had the same question when I, went, when I started working for Atomic. I'm like, can we do some kind of custom program where it's not custom colors, who cares, but can I build boots for, for a shop? Mm -hmm. I want a 130 lower shell or a one, with yep. a 110 cuff, yep. right? There are some really cool things here that could be done. The complexity becomes so enormously complicated that it makes it really hard for the shops to stock it. It makes it hard for the brands to stock everything. It would basically mean things just, instead of evolving every two years, they would evolve every six or seven years. Like the, the speed would have to slow down just so we would have stock always for you know, your shop to yep. call up and say, hey, I need this shell, I need this cuff, I need this liner type of thing. It just gets so complicated that when you look at the Atomic catalog, for example, there are 115 models in it that are in the inline catalog. There's about 135 total because we make SMUs, which are special makeups for certain shops, when they hit minimum quantities. So if, if a shop wants to order something special out of a catalog, it's 1,000 pairs minimum for us to even push the button to make it, you know? So it's possible. It's totally possible. It's just can things get enough volume behind them yeah. to make it worthwhile for everybody to just get on board with. And right. that'll be hard. Calling that good. I promise we're going to do a follow-up Gear 30 podcast along this topic. <laughs> so let's keep it moving. Four up. hours coming your way. Yeah, you're welcome. You're, you're welcome. Welcome, Fit. Front row, <laughs> extra five points. I hope I don't beat a dead horse then with this question, but uh, there's no like, there's no bad weather. There's just bad gear, right? If I buy a thousand dollar pair of jacket and a pair of pants, they better keep me dry. Why do I have to buy a uh, eight hundred dollar pair of boots that doesn't keep my feet warm in a cold, cold sport? You're standing on snow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I get it. Uh, no, I mean, I mean sure, no, 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 if, the, if the answer is I should just buy heated socks and just go that route, I'm, I'll do that. But That seems to be the easiest way right now, currently. No, really. Yeah. Um, one of the things ski boot brands aren't great at is electronics. And when we do try to make heated liners, this is totally possible, but there's an incredibly high warranty rate. You, 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 people are worrying about BOA breaking, you know, heated uh, liners. It's a freaking nightmare that just we've been approached many times to go down, but it's just honestly, you don't want that coming your way from a ski boot brand. And <laughs> right now, I, I can tell you, <laughs> I went down that route with a vendor, and I'm just going to take a guess. A ski boot warranty is under, well, it's like 0.05%, right, for liners. We wound up eating just because of the electronics in the batteries, hmm. it, I'm going to say 20 percent. Huh. It was it, the that's problem, generous. That's yeah. generous. The problem it's is once it's integrated in the liner, now we're throwing out the whole thing. Uh, the hot tronics, those kind of stuff under your footbed, great. Um, to go to your, your problem, though, if, if your feet are that cold, to me, it always comes down to circulation, and that's a boot fit issue, circulation, circulation, circulation. Because if you're out there and your heart is going that fast and you're, you're having cold feet, there's something else going on. Okay. Or you're skiing really fast. Next question. <laughs> 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 True 22 shells. Are they happening? They do now. Mm -hmm. I have them. But like... Let's name names. Uh, well, what are you looking for? Because, yeah, I got everything that I make in a 22. But what... Tell me more about what features you The issue I'm finding with a lot of shells is that it's a 23 shell with just like a thicker liner or like mm -hmm. a toe cap. 
-hmm. or something like that that makes it a little smaller in one direction or one way but isn't fully a size smaller than the totally yep uh every 22 that atomic makes is a true 22 in every sense of the way Uh, we even make true 21s in some of our boots you're allowed to brag you're allowed to brag Mm -hmm. some brands are doing that though to be honest um they just don't see the return on investment of making uh, of spending the money to launch a a dedicated shell and cuff for that. I'm not justifying it. That's just their explanation for it. Um, I think if, if you're really serious about making feet happy, you have to have more 21s even in the industry. So um, I think you'll be seeing that from more brands that are paying attention. Um, currently, I know of two, Lang and Atomic, that make true 21s um, in racing unfortunately, but you're going to be seeing that kind of echo outwards from there for sure. Can we move on? Sure. Next. Oh, boy. Uh, Sorry, guys. (laughs) This is a boot panel. Oh, yeah. No, I I love the ski boots. Curious, though, um, how... (laughs) This is a serious question, but I want to talk to you guys like DinaFit and Atomic about the, like, the midsection, the throat of the boot and how it affects performance. Like, for example, like the Vulcan and Hoji, your pro model, they were really tight and difficult to fit in that area. And now the Radical and the Tie Guard are massive. And I know the early generations of like a Hawks Ultra was very difficult for consumers to put on. And now that's a lot easier. And is that change happening because it's hard for consumers to put on boots? And how is that affecting performance? You want to go first? He said your name first. Okay, I'm, I'm first, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, on, on most of the boots you mentioned, like, I, I didn't have, uh, like, I wasn't a voice. Like, I provided feedback, of course, but, like, not designing, actually. Like, part of the, the real meat of the design of, of those boots uh, as far <coughs> as the fitting um, of yeah, like the radical boot is made to be this kind of generalized fit to accommodate a lot of different feet and get in easily and be easy to use. Um, the new boot that we were talking about earlier, kind of that's one of the the main problems or requests or like what were the goals that that I was trying to get to was to have something that's highly adaptable and not just built into the last. Um, So it should be relatively easy to get in, pretty high volume, but the the foot retention for lower volume feet and skinnier ankles is is independent of the last shape. Um, And I think that's that's a a really important thing and maybe that's like something that all manufacturers will, if it's successful or whatever, but uh, it's it's a, a real problem and uh, something, a goal to get to. Mm-hmm. Good? Yeah. Last two, we, I'm gonna, I have to cut this off in five minutes. I, you guys should ask stupider questions next time, please. Please. Okay, this panel has talked about different parts of a boot and the complexity of building a boot and how it affects cost. Now there's one feature with a lot of boots that you haven't mentioned, and that is canting or cuff alignment. Is that a worthwhile feature to have on boots, given the fact that, in my experience, no boot fitter has ever mentioned that to me unless I brought it up? Very worthwhile. Okay. Um, definitely one of the adjustments that, that boot fitters either tend to do later in the discussion or sometimes not at all, especially if you go over to Europe. This is kind of a what are you talking about type of adjustment. Um, But again, speaking for my brand, tooting my own horn, uh, all of our boots have dual-sided cuff alignment, meaning it's on the medial side and the lateral side um, in the adult range um, for fixed cuff alpine boots. Walk modes, it gets a little tricky with lining up the walk mode with the pin on the heel. But um, it's it's a super important thing um, because as 
Jonathan knows, I know, I'm, we're very bow-legged. And when you stand in a boot that has the cuff just going straight up, but our, our, our legs do one of these, you know, it, it is just not even comfortable to stand in it, right? So the cuff should be aligned with the leg at the very least. Um, you get a different approach in racing. Racing tends to think about, well, how can I make this boot faster? And that's literally a talking point is making fast ski boots, which is wrap your head around that for a second. Um, so can't cuff alignment um, takes on a different perspective in, in the race world. Um, but it's something that if, if you're looking to eke out the, those little improvements in your fit, in your comfort, and in your performance, you definitely want to have your cuff alignment checked. 100% correct. Hmm. Yeah. Last question. Cool. I get the uh, honored to have the last question. Okay. We talked about product market fit, right? Matt, that's what you're saying. The problem is we're trying to get a better fitting boot. Talked about liners, you know, footbeds. Where do you all think about the future of custom boots, right? What does that look like from a technology or a manufacturing perspective? Does it fit in this repertoire of solutions we have to develop a better fit? Greg? Um, okay. So almost all custom boot fitting is pushing out on the liner on the shell. Um, I think, you know, as you're getting, literally if I took a mold of your foot and went and built something, I'm taking out the negative spots. Um, we've tried a couple of things along those lines, but you know, it, you know, it's not going to be one of those days where you go and scan your foot into a scanner and then we 3D print your shell and the liner and everything like that. That would be the ultimate custom, well, right? What's keeping us from doing that? Materials. I, I can answer that. Yeah. Well, once you're done, I can help. No, you knock you're yourself out. Quick. Okay. We got to quit. Yep. Um, okay. 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 Um, <laughs> We, we 3D print ski boots right now at Atomic. Um, they're not skiable. You, you, can't, you can't even put your foot into it without cracking it. Yeah. And the materials aren't there yet, and the speed to make it isn't there yet. We make about, roughly speaking, about 2,500 ski boots a day. To 3D print the right shell takes a weekend for us. So not even a pair of complete boots. So the technology for, for doing this is in its really infancy stages, at least what we can afford, and we can afford a lot at this moment. Um, it's just not quite there yet, to be honest. Materials and time to create. Um, you all asked amazing questions, really. Um, I want to thank these three because, I, one, I just don't know a lot of places where a conversation like this happens, and for questions like yours to be asked to people like this, with the amount of experience up here, to people who are shaping ski boot culture right now, um, it's pretty impressive and pretty cool, and so it's um, as much crap as I like to give you all sometimes. Um, it's, it's very cool to have this happen. Thank you so much, um, y'all who were part of this. Um, lucky you. Um, thanks to all of you.